Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Real Talk Office Hours for Friday, May 15, 2020. Quick introduction to Startup Grind, the host of this podcast and uh, series. It is the world's largest startup community with 600 chapters in over 125 countries. We operate on a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. And it's in that light that George came to me and asked if I thought it'd be valuable and if I'd be interested in hosting an update on global markets and expert roundtable where entrepreneurs and leaders could come and ask for actionable advice. Fact is, majority of entrepreneurs today didn't have to lead through the Great Recession. They weren't CEOs during the dot-com bubble, and they didn't even study the markets uh, even pre previous to those crashes and crises. How are they then to be expected to do anything but follow their guts or the reactionary examples of their peers? In a world of alternative facts and fake news, we should be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. The reason is because the pandemic has been and will continue to be the great global leveler. We invite you to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time as we track the intersection of facts, bias, and action through the analysis of global markets, followed by that actionable advice given to entrepreneurs who are desperate for this advice as they do their very best for their businesses, teams, and families. Now, if you missed the live events, you can view the recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids, where you can also download the notes from the presentations, as well as find us at YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere where you find your favorite podcasts. Quickly, a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our presenter, George. Comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to incite invite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform, not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade or, and, or invest, please call your broker. And with that, I'm going to give this over to you, George. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Talk. Another day in the financial markets, another day in the global economy. And the trend is beginning now to continue. You remember that at the beginning of our Real Talk series, we focused on entrepreneurs and investors. We focused on risk takers across jurisdictions, across nation states, across states, and across currencies. And what we mentioned is that we have to look into the public markets for nuggets of information, for any indication of change to the pre-pandemic norm. Then over the last few weeks, we have emphasized the fact that the markets will give us information about what they perceive to be the period of transition to the next normal. The markets are still absorbing the pre-pandemic environment. They're absorbing the pandemic's effects and they're beginning to see the reactions of the various governments around the world and thereby price accordingly different assets, including currencies, bonds, equities, commodities, and real estate. Let's start with currencies. You see here that um, the dollar is remaining fairly strong. It continues um, the um, Excuse me for a second. I just want to rebalance our um, screens here. You can see that um, the dollar is uh, remaining strong. It's trading just uh, over $1.08 per euro. It has strengthened from Wednesday against the yen. It is strengthening against sterling and so on and so forth. The reason we have a strong dollar is because of a number of factors involving one, safe haven considerations, two, 
appropriate policy response, and three, divergence in policies on a global basis. Number one, safe haven. The dollar as a reserve currency remains a safe haven for global entrepreneurs and risk takers. Number two, fiscal policy and monetary policy responses. Back in the midst of this crisis in mid-March, the Federal Reserve took dramatic and unprecedented steps to support the US economy and to provide liquidity to the global economy. The third point is divergence. We have seen that other governments have been either slow or limited in their responses, both at the monetary level and at the fiscal level. For instance, it was only this morning that the European Union, after a virtual meeting of the finance ministers, decided to issue $260 billion worth of emergency funding to all member states. Every government in Europe effective now will be able to use the European stability mechanism to borrow up to 2% of its gross domestic product in 2019 to be able to pay for healthcare expenses. This is the first time that Europe is issuing across the board a euro-based, a euro-denominated support for all member states. Expect to hear more in Europe. As our um, analysts from other markets have shown, however, there is a big discrepancy between the fiscal response of advanced post-industrialized societies like the US, Europe, and Japan in comparison with emerging markets or less developed countries. The US has borrowed up to 14% of its gross domestic product so far. If you look at some of the lower income countries in Europe, like Spain and Italy, it's not more than 1.7, 1.6%. If you look at some of the African countries, they have not been able to borrow at all. So to go forward from this starting point, we go back into our bonds environment. We will look how the bonds in Asia closed. Remember the Asian markets closed a few hours ago. In Japan, interest rates remain anchored at almost 0%. Australia is 0.9%, New Zealand 0.6%, India 5.7%, South Korea 1.4%. Interestingly, with the exception of Japan, the 10-year borrowing of Asian countries in their own currencies remains positive. So we have not had this malaise of negative interest rates that we've seen in other parts of the world. Look at Europe, for instance. Switzerland, if you want to buy a, uh, if you want to invest in a 10 year bond issued by the Swiss National Bank, you will be paying the Swiss bank 0.6% every year. I know that sounds counterintuitive. Why should you pay some? But this is the case. Safe saving considerations are pushing people to negative interest rates. The same in Germany. If you want to hold, if you want to invest in 10 year bonds issued by the Bundesbank, the German Central Bank, you will be paying 0.5% every year for the next 10 years. In the UK, we have 0.23% being the interest on a 10 year bond. Italy, it has increased slightly to 1.86, Spain 0.75 and Greece remains around 2%. In contrast, in the United States, the um, 10 year bond is um, at 0.64%, Canada 0.54 and Mexico at 6%. No major changes here. To make Absolutely clear, investors invest in government bonds because they're concerned, because they're afraid. Now, you may be asking yourself, 
how come the interest rate in the US is so low after the central bank, the Federal Reserve has issued so much money after Congress has authorized so much spending? And the answer is we have low inflation and this money is absorbed by investors. This is an indication of the success of the policy of the Federal Reserve. And this success feeds as a loop into the dollar strength. So if you want to prepare yourself and to warn your friends, you always tell them, look at dollar euro rate and dollar yen rate. If investors get spooked, if investors disagree with the policy, you will see the first effects on the currencies. I don't think this is likely to happen in the short term. I think, as I mentioned at the uh, opening of today's uh, Real Talk, entrepreneurs and investors should be listening to the Fed. They should be listening to the policies of the Congress in the US because we need to have an expansionary fiscal policy to avoid a depression. Let's look at commodities. As usual, um, in the real talk, I only focus on oil and gas. We see that um, the West Texas Intermediate is a shy below $30 a barrel. The Brent is already above $30 a barrel. And natural gas is at $1.7 per thousand BTUs. Gold has jumped to $1,760 almost. And the reason is because investors are concerned. In agriculture, we have seen that corn is hovering around $320, wheat is um, at about $500, and live cattle a shy below $100 per pound. The equity market in Asia closed mixed with an Nikkei posing a 0.6% gain compared to yesterday's close. The Hang Seng was barely flat, just 0.14% down. Australia was 1.4% uh, up. And as a whole, the Asia Pacific region was about 1.5% down compared to Thursday's close. Why is this the case? Well, there were more sellers than buyers. When you have more sellers than buyers, asset prices go down. Why do you have more sellers than buyers? Obviously, the rally is beginning to make investors skeptical. Entrepreneurs are skeptical about asset prices. As we are opening our economies up, expectations about reverting to the pre-pandemic normal are exaggerated. And we've mentioned this. We hear it from entrepreneurs in Michigan. We hear it from entrepreneurs across the United States. We see it from CEOs quarterly press releases. Visibility is almost non-existent. This earnings season covering the first quarter of 2020 was illustrative in that more than 80% of CEOs of publicly recorded companies in the US refused to give guidance. Now, based on this, you have to question what is the drive behind this equity market's outperformance? And clearly, it has been liquidity and positive thinking. In Europe today, we had a positive response, mainly to the European Union's decision to issue these $260 billion worth of support. That is probably a positive indicator for the cohesion of the European Union. However, the discrepancies in each member states economic policies both fiscal and monetary are evident and in the next few real talks we'll be covering among other things europe today equities markets in the us are slightly 
lower, slightly higher, mixed. The Nasdaq is up 0.2%, the S&P is down 0.2%, the Dow Jones is down 0.2%. This is better than the market was at the opening in the morning. And we have to see how the market proceeds. However, please bear in mind that the public markets are forward-looking. And this forward-looking aspect of the public markets is always, always challenged by expectations. Thank you, Corey. I'll read back to you. Great. Thank you very much, George. Um, what I like about our focus it has, it has been for the last few weeks is really um, uh, like talking about the, the silver lining. Um, and now that we have more data, the exciting thing is that the silver lining might just become a little, a little more clear. So there is an event that happened um, in, the, in Australia with uh, the second largest uh, airline declaring bankruptcy. And then just, was it yesterday or today, a bunch of um, prospective bids coming in and a lot of investors thinking that there might not be something so bad to being the number two carrier. Um, do you see a silver lining in, in those types of uh, like optimistic outlooks? Corey, remember by nature we're contrarians because we um, tend to think that crises do not come in a uniform, so to speak, um, structure or path. We have also emphasized that there's a difference in tempo across regions of the planet and economies. I think that the airline industry is one of these industries that is going to suffer the most. I was looking at uh, the news uh, earlier today and I saw that um, high net worth individuals, very rich people on this planet, are beginning to use the private jet airline industry. It, it is, it is um, an industry, it's a part of the airline industry that has been overlooked and is now experiencing a blossoming. Um, of course, these individuals are also planning on holidays at the end of this year to exotic islands and this and that and the other. Well, th what does this do for Joe Smith and for you and I, who are perhaps less affluent than these individuals? The answer is that we, I'm not prepared to put money to work for the airline industry. Remember two weeks ago, we had um, Warren Buffett making uh, his, um, presenting his uh, case to the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. Where he, he made had, a very clear statement. <laughs> absolutely. He sold out of the industry. So again, um, I am not as, um, how could I? I put it risk averse often as I would like to be. On the other hand, I'm not ready to put money to work in the airline industry. However, having said that, um, depending on the price, in other words, at what price are these investors going to buy the distressed assets of this airline? De depending on the price, they may have a um, bright outlook. Yeah. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about uh, the PPP loans. Um, a lot of news coming out as far as uh, many small businesses saying, nope, that's not a good enough deal for me. I'm just not even going to bother with it. Uh, then the response being, you know what, let's, uh, let's be a little more flexible with these rules. Uh, do, you, uh, do you recommend that small businesses um, look into what uh, what these safe harbor uh, propositions are, um, maybe revisit the idea as the PPP loan program. Understanding, of course, that they're saying, yeah, the rules are becoming more flexible. And some people are even saying, go ahead and take them, understand, like hoping that you can make a case down the road for the forgiveness. When um, you're in the middle of the, um Lake Michigan sailing the boat and you're experiencing um, inclement weather, every rope 
that is available on the boat becomes useful. I think that as a seasoned entrepreneurs, we have always recommended that you take support, you heed comfort in any safe haven, even if it is a temporary one. Um, I think that what we hear from Congress about the next stimulus package or uh, relief package, whatever we want to call it, is clear that the government and Congress, both the House and the Senate, will try to provide a safe mechanism for businesses and for individuals here in the US. I think entrepreneurs have nothing to lose except time when they're applying for these funds. I also think that they have to use every item that becomes available to them because it is their responsibility if they decide to keep the business going to find support if on the other hand they decide that their competitiveness is no longer warranted then they should be graceful enough to exit the business the question is not whether i take ppp or whether i take um, government handouts the question is based on my 13 week cash flow analysis do i see that this business is viable if the business is viable then yes proceed accordingly if the business is not viable do not waste your time and do not waste the capital because it could be allocated somewhere more efficiently that's a great recommendation thank you um, I, I, am in, I am interested in uh, covering the, the issue of bonds a little bit further. You were talking about it like a little earlier when we're looking at the, the bonds and we're looking at investors and we're looking at uh, how much appetite they have for risk, especially now that we're seeing um, folks paying governments to hold on to their money. Um, like the whole idea of a bond is to just get your money back, right? That's, that's the biggest thing I'm worried about. Well, um, okay, this is the biggest difference between investing in equities and investing in bonds. An investor in equities is concerned about getting his or her money back. An investor in bonds has two considerations. One is to receive his principal capital invested back and to receive the investment from the issuer of these bonds on a regular basis. In other words, if you have an annual bond, a 10 year bond issued by the treasury that pays interest on an annual basis, the bond investor has two risks. One is getting the interest payment on an annual basis. And the second is of getting the principal back at the end of the 10 year period. So what you have here is two types of risks, as opposed to the bond where you have only one, sorry, to the uh, equity where you have only one risk. Um, and that's why the credit rating is so important. Great. Credit rating being the rating that agencies such as Moody's, Standard & Poor's and Fitch issue for, borrowers, for borrowers of bonds and it reflects the credit worthiness of these issuing institutions the top credit rating is triple a the top credit rating is triple a i believe uh, in investment grade and the lowest in credit investment grade rating is triple b minus everything below triple b minus is considered to be a junk bond or what we call a high yield bond Cool. I if, think you it, think, uh, if you think, Corey, that it will be of interest, what we could do is we could structure one of our real talk events and talk about bonds and credit ratings and why these are important. And then we could um, seg uh, segue into the um, municipal bond rating and how every state in the U.S. has slightly different credit rating based on their ability to raise taxes, 
the fiscal responsibilities and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think it'd be fun to uh, to have those as future resources so that we could also continually point folks to those particular episodes or notes um, as they try to um, get a bearing on digesting all the all the information. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's before, all I really... Yeah. Before you, you change topic, may I show you for a moment, in uh, Bloomberg, you have under the US, um, the yields of bonds issued by the government. And these are the traditional yields. We went through them last time. The three month has a yield of 0 0.11, six month 0 0.14, 12 month 0 0.14, Two years zero fifteen, five years zero thirty one, ten year point six four, and thirty year one point three two percent. These are the costs of borrowing for three months all the way to thirty years for the U.S. Treasury. If you look at municipal bonds, we have a similar, so to speak, time horizon from one year over to thirty years, and you can see that. One year municipal bonds yield again as a group 0.3%, two years 0.44, five years 0.7, 10 year 1.04, and 30 year 1.93. Clearly, they are higher than the government, reflecting different kind of risk. However, in these municipal bonds, you can find nuggets of states that are performing better than others. This is the cost of borrowing of each one of the states, roughly on average, from one year to 30 years. Was there anything that you wanted to cover um, before we uh, took off? Yes, the last point uh, that I would like to um, leave um, for our audience for the weekend is um, for them to go back into the textbooks and or old newspaper clips and start reading about universal basic income. More than any other topic, this will come to the fore over the next few months and years. And the reason is because our society will need to rethink our support mechanisms. The universal basic income, or whatever way it will be called going forward, will be part of the effort to support those with lower incomes. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, this is one of the items of social welfare that we will see being re-examined. The other two cover education, especially higher education, and um, the uh, um, healthcare. Healthcare, education, and um, unemployment benefits are going to be the three pivotal, I think, areas that are going to be addressed by this Congress and this administration as we're going to the next level beyond the summer into probably a different world post pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we'll, uh, and uh, a lot of, a lot of folks are saying that, yeah, we're, this is years long. Uh, many surveys are coming back. Uh, even small businesses are, are thinking that uh, not even by the middle of next year, um, are they going to be able to, I think it can be looking at anywhere near what was in the past <laughs> as far as uh, receipts. So um, as we've said before, uh, let your curiosity lead you to the best facts you can find. Uh, I was really uh, happy to see uh, Denmark's uh, director of um, the Danish Health Authority, uh, Soren Brostrom. He said, you need to know your epidemic. You need to control it. And you need to be able to have confidence in your data. Only then, as entrepreneurs, can we really be um, as certain as we need to be to reopen, re-engage, realign, pivot, and uh, identify those silver linings. Um, so. That's a great, great quote, actually. The idea of making decisions based on hard data as opposed to conjecture and or wishful thinking.
Yes, and with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, and we will see you Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, for another uh, episode of Real Talk. Thank you. Thank you.